wisdom, justice, temperance, courage. Applying ancient philosophy to modern life, this is the Sunday Stoic. <laughs> All right. Welcome to the Sunday Stoic Podcast. Today, Dr. Gregory Sadler joins us. He has an MA and a PhD in philosophy from Southern Illinois University at Carbondale and is the founder of Reason.io, an editor for Stoicism Today, and also a teacher, and he produces a plethora of content on YouTube. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. So... Before we get started, I did a very short intro. Would you tell you have a varied biography, uh, an interesting past? Would you talk a little bit about yourself and your background? Yeah, I started out, you could say, as a traditional academic. Although I was, um, my first teaching gig was was in a maximum security prison, teaching in a four year degree program. Uh, and then I went down, and I was at for Ball State University at Indiana State Prison, and then I went down to uh, Fayetteville State University. And I was, you know, doing the usual professor stuff, teaching and publishing articles and doing some some public speaking and, and uh, some other things as well. And then I, I uh, moved up to New York so I could be with my now wife at that time, fiance, and started just teaching part time and, and doing more and more of the video work. And then things just kind of spiraled from there and I, I found myself in a lot of cases teaching just a few classes and doing much more entrepreneurial work and then yeah the stoicism today thing uh started in 2016 i think um i'd you know written a few things for them and i was i was shooting videos and they they said well the the editor is wanting to step down, do you want to be the editor? And, and it was kind of a big surprise, but it was really cool because it meant getting involved with the modern stoicism organization and getting to interact pretty regularly with some of the, the big big stars, you could say, <laughs> of the, the modern stoic movement, who are all very nice people, you know. And um, now I, I sort of split my time between teaching, although this, this semester you, you'd look at me and actually think I'm, I'm more than a full-time academic given how many courses I'm teaching. <laughs> um, I'm actually teaching seven this, wow. this semester. Wow. You're busy. You're, you're yeah, busy. And, I turn, and I turn down six more invitations to, to teach. Wow. Um, so it's, it's kind of a crazy time. But, but I have my own business on the side, Reason I Own. I, I do a lot of uh, um, talks and, and you know, tutoring and consulting work and things like that. And, and I should mention, too, up front, I'm, I, I don't say that I'm a Stoic in the sense that I'm exclusively drawing on the Stoics. I'm much more like Cicero, sort of an eclectic, where um, I draw on the Stoic tradition, the Aristotelian tradition, the, the Platonic tradition running through the middle Platonists and some other things, and, and use all of that in my, my work. But there are some things where I think the Stoics are particularly strong, so um, I... Uh, you know, I, I don't I don't bill myself as such, but sure, um, there, there's kind of a substantive background in it. Yeah, and I'll tell you too. I got into I, I you know I'd read the Stoics when I was in college. Uh, you know, Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus is and it didn't didn't really stick that much. I liked the you know sort of toughness aspect, but didn't really get a lot of the cosmological things. And you know, when they were talking about wisdom and justice, I was like, ah, I'll forget, I'll fit all that stuff. <laughs> And and I got I got more interested in the Stoics because I was interested in uh, the issue of the will, and how we make choices. And then I, I started doing a lot of work in the early two thousands on on anger in ancient philosophy, because I was a really angry guy and I wanted to do you know so look for resources on anger management, and I found a lot of stuff that was very helpful in the Stoics. And so that that drew me in, and I started taking a look at them with uh, like a a more, what would you say, a more open mind and a more careful eye. Sure. Yeah. And then found all this really cool stuff in there. Um, I should talk to you about that because anger management is something I should probably be better at. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's... it's I know it's, I, Seneca has a lot to say. Is Seneca your primary source for that information? Well, or? Seneca has a book on anger, but there's a lot of stuff as well in Marcus Aurelius. It's just kind of scattered around and in... Epictetus, 
as well. And then some things in, in Cicero's uh, Tusculan uh, Disputations, which are essentially you know, presenting a Stoic point of view. Right, um, right. So all of that's pretty helpful. Um, now, how did you, the, oh, go ahead. Were, were, were you in the military before you went to school? I was, and if I hadn't gone in, I don't think I could have made it through college because um, being, even though I didn't spend as much time as I signed up for, I was only in for a year and three months because I got out in the budget cuts of, uh, oh. of uh, 90 shortly before uh, we, we froze all that under Desert Shield. Uh, in 19, you know, 1989, 1990, we had the peace dividend, the wall came down, and, right. and now it was like, let's get rid of as, as many people as we could. And I saw a lot of really good NCOs getting booted out. And I've talked with some people afterwards uh, who have confirmed that there was something like a quota system in, in, in uh, process there. Uh. So given the chance to get out, I, I took it. I was a combat engineer, which means that during peacetime, you, you do plenty of cool drills and stuff, but you also do a lot of uh, cooling your heels and, and painting and cleaning and things like that. <laughs> and they, you know, my, the guys in my unit, they got in a lot of trouble. Um, we, had the, we had the high, according to what they were saying, we had the highest rate of people getting kicked out in Europe in our battalion wow. at that time. So it was kind of a, it was kind of a mess. Um, sure. But, it, it, you know, living that disciplined military lifestyle, even though it wasn't completely disciplined, <laughs> uh, turned out to be really important for, for me when I went off to college. Um, I came in and I was 20 years old as opposed to being 18 years old. I'd been, I'd been living in Germany for a while and had uh, done, you know, done some fun stuff. And, and uh, I was ready to learn as opposed to many of my classmates who didn't, didn't seem quite so. <laughs> So ready. I, I'm familiar with this phenomenon. Yeah. They were ready to learn how to drink. You know? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So what what made you? I mean, did you were you a philosophy major from day one, or what got you into that door? I was, but not for any good reasons. Okay. Um, my mother's boyfriend had told me that when I got to college, I should declare a major right away, so I wouldn't be lost in a sea of freshmen. <laughs> and I looked down the list and I, I, you know, I'd read a little bit of philosophy and I, I, you know, saw philosophy on the list. And I was like, that sounds cool. I'll major in philosophy. So my, my advisor said, oh, OK, well, then we'll put you in the intro to philosophy class. And, you know, I got to sign you up for your writing class. And he, he, he also threw me into a Calc 1 class because my, my scores were high on my SAT. Gotcha. And uh, that actually turned out to be quite good. I majored in both mathematics and philosophy. Oh, wow. And, and the reason was because, um, you know, people teach calc in different ways. Some people are much more into the applications and here's the equations for things. And some people are more theory. And so this guy who I had, he started out the very first day teaching us the uh, theory of limits. And I was like, holy crap, this is math? <laughs> I'd never seen anything like this before in my life. The math classes we had were really boring and, you know, I wasn't being challenged intellectually in them. You know, it was just, well, here's what you got to memorize. And, and there was never any explanation of what was actually happening in math. So, so I, I took that and then I just kept taking more and more math and philosophy classes and, you know, wound up with, with a, a double major in, in both. Did, did some stuff at the boundaries between them, like, philo you know, the philosophy of mathematics, foundations of mathematics, logic, mm -hmm. that, that sort of business. Um, and, that, and then that sort of moved me into philosophy of language by the time I got to grad school. And I, and I did take a year off, too. I didn't go to grad school right away. Yeah. I worked and, you know, worked on my languages, um, worked out a lot, um, and, uh, you know, had, had a good time. Then I, then I was ready for, for going to grad school. <laughs> well, and, I enjoy, I enjoy uh, uh, you were just talking about working out a lot. I see that's still a major component of your life from what I can tell on Twitter. Well, it's become it. Um, and so, I, you know, I was just telling my students the other day, um, never let yourself get out of shape. Because when you try to get yourself back in shape, when you're in your 20s, it's not hard. You know, you just you have a couple days of being sore and all that. When you're in your 30s, which, which I've done as well, um, letting myself get out of shape and then starting a regimen again, it's a lot harder. And yeah. when you're in your late 40s, man, it is a lot of work. <laughs> you know? so, so I'm doing it. I'm, I'm getting to the gym you know, when I'm not sick three days a week and, and uh, 
hopefully once this crazy semester is over, I can, I can start doing more, but, um, it's, it's rough, <laughs> but necessary, you know? Yeah. I mean, if we're, if we're talking about stoic stuff, right. You know, you were talking about the dichotomy of control a little bit earlier and a lot of people will say, well, the body's not in my control because Epictetus said so. Um, and that's true to some degree, but you notice all these athletic metaphors in, in Epictetus. Um, so clearly he had some interest in exercise. Yeah. Um, and, and then you realize the body is something that we, it, it is an indifferent, but it's an indifferent that we're supposed to use properly or deal with properly. The Greek term is uh, chresis, you know, use is how we translate it. But it also gets translated as, as dealing with, um, like when we talk about dealing with appearances or, or addressing appearances, that's the Greek term. And so Epictetus is really clear about this. He says, indifference themselves, you know, are not in our control, but what we do with them, that's in our control. So, right. you know, if, if we, we can't just say, well, um, the body's not in my control, so I'm going to sit on the couch and eat chips and <laughs> watch TV all day. Sounds <laughs> pretty sweet. <laughs> Yeah. So, so I guess now help me use terminology correctly here. So the body would have uh, axia. Is that the word? Some value? Yeah. I mean, most things have some, some value yeah. in the stoic scheme. The The example that they give of something that like has no, or it's like totally neutral, no, no positive or negative value is the, whether the hairs on your head are even or odd in number, you know? <laughs> And, and I can't picture any situation in which somehow that would make any difference whatsoever. Right, right. Yeah, I don't think so either. <laughs> but yeah, having your body in, in decent shape. So the health of the body is, is uh, it's an indifferent, but it's a preferred indifferent. And um, part, of, part of prudence is, is managing preferred indifference properly, you know. It's the tool for the job, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things we got to we have to do with our body. It's what carts us around, and um, it's, it's the whole interface with the world. So, right. and, and and you know, for the for, from a classic Stoic perspective, um, everything is material except for the, the few immaterials, and and so the body is uh, the locus where everything else uh, has its has its meet up with the world. Well, I've been trying. I just did a couch to 5K because I was woefully out of shape. And so now I'm able to do that. I don't love it yet, but I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, so you're running pretty, pretty uh, frequently. I'm trying to do it three times a week. And I think next, yeah. is, next is going to probably be uh, on campus here. We can hire a, uh, a personal trainer to get us doing other things. And I might do that so I can set up a proper regimen. You know, when, when I went, so we belong to a health club, the Wisconsin Athletic Club, and it's one of these nice places. Um, we, got, we got a deal on the membership, so that's how we can actually mm -hmm. you know, afford it. Um, and they have trainers, and they have all these different exercises that you can do. And I was, I was really surprised by like how many classes they offer and how many different modes of exercise are now available um, for people to, to learn and try out. Obviously, you can't do them all. Right. Um, but most of them seem pretty interesting. Hmm. And, and I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to when I have a bit more time, like sure. taking a box. When you're not class teaching or... 17 classes. Or... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I have, to, I have to learn when it, when it comes to that, I have to learn to say no. Right, right. A bit more. Uh, that, that's probably, there's readily. probably some philosophy on that as well uh, that you could, you could summon for courage to say no, I guess. Yeah, I mean, the problem was <laughs> I had um, institutions that I had a connection with coming to me with, with genuine needs to staff classes. Yeah. And so I started out with only four classes on the books, which is already quite a bit. But I was like, yeah, I've done it before. That's, that's not bad. And I, I actually taught eight in a semester before as well. So I know it's doable. Um, but then I had another, you know, another institution come to me that, that wasn't going to be hiring me for the fall because they didn't have the enrollment. And now, and now suddenly they had a boost in enrollment and they're like, Hey, we really need somebody to teach, you know, can you do it? And I was like, I guess I could do a class. And they're like, can you do two? You know, so, <laughs> slip, yeah, slip yeah. another one in there. <laughs> yeah. And then, then another one, which I was already teaching for, um, said, you know, we, we really need to fill these, these sections. Do you think you could take over one of those? And I, and I said, yeah, I guess so. 
Um, but I'm going to start scaling back on that. Understandable. Yeah. I will say I will say also that uh, so the audience knows uh, <laughs> that you are responsible for um, some. Uh, actually, it's your fault that my child's daycare teacher was going nuts. I just thought. You oh, should really? Know that. Yeah, yeah. Because how, how did that come about? Well, uh, lo- uh, this is a, a, a you know like in stoicism, you know all things are caused and uh, caused by something, right? There's there's yeah. actions and reactions. Well, you posted a thing on Facebook or on Twitter about Leon Redbone passing away. Oh, yeah. And then I had not known about Leon Redbone, looked him up and and cuz I like I love music and his music, oh, I I like that. I like that finger picking kind of old-timey stuff and he had that cool personality go along yeah. with it. Uh and then my son fell in love with Polly Wally Doodle all day. Okay. And then he would sing it nonstop at daycare. <laughs> and it, his his teacher, then other kids started singing it. And then oh, his great. teacher was going crazy. So then the other teacher at daycare taught all of her kids to sing it. And then then when that when the, the teacher that was going nuts went to the restroom, all the kids s- w- stood outside the bathroom and they all sang it in unison. Um Wow. So Leon Redbone's having ripples at daycare here in Arkansas. Yeah. Uh, thanks to you, oddly enough. I just thought you should know that it was all your fault. Um. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think I think on that tweet I said, now we'll never know what Diddy Wop Diddy means, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what does it mean? Yeah, oh yeah, my son likes to sing that one too. Um, you know who, uh, it's, who actually got me into it was my dad. Yeah. Um, he was a huge Leon Redbone fan. Yeah. Um, Big big music fan in general. We had all these these really cool like classic jazz records, and he got into bluegrass uh, for a while. He'd actually go down to Kentucky to these festivals wow. and stuff. Um, so you know, it's unfortunate he died when I was eleven, and my, my yeah. sister was only nine. So I never, you know, I, I listened to this stuff with him, but I never really got to talk with him about it. And I, I right. kind of wish that I'd, I'd had these more adult conversations about. Why did you know what? What did you really like about Cannonball Elderly, or what did you know? What, what, why did you have this Blood, Sweat, and Tears album, and not the other ones, or things like that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's too bad. That's rough. Uh, I, uh, I, I've I've enjoyed music. I, 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 you play banjo as well, is that, or do you? St- well, I, I do, but I don't I've seen play. Pictures. I don't play banjo the way that people usually play banjo. So, okay. I mean, I, I use a lot of the techniques. I strum, I, I do claw hammer, I do, you know, uh, picking and rolls and stuff like that. But most of the stuff that I play is, is either, you know, um, rock or metal. I, I, so, I hear banjo <laughs> lends itself to Keith Richards' licks, so. I guess I could. I don't, I don't, I don't know that I know any Stone songs. <laughs> he plays but an he, open G a lot, that's all. I mean, what, what would happen is I'd, I'd like, uh, so it was my dad's banjo. Okay. He, he bought it when folk was real big. Mm-hmm. when he was a college student and then you know when he died it became mine and I, I played it a bit in high school um but then i was like learning black sabbath songs on it you know um and uh then i i dropped <laughs> it because i i started playing bass and it's, you can't really play if you're finger picking bass you can't really effectively have the nails that you need for banjo right. and play bass because they'll the, you know bass wears off your nails and your finger pads and stuff like that. So I was playing bass pretty much all the way through uh, undergraduate. And then um, when I was in grad school, I didn't really play much of anything. And then I, I finished up and, and I, you know, we moved to Indiana where, where my family has some land. And, and uh, uh, I started picking up the banjo again and playing things. And I, I used it so that I could, I, I learned some old timey stuff, you know, like Kingston Trio stuff. Um, but it was mostly so I could play rock songs that I wanted to, uh, sing and play at the same time. Yeah. So I, I used it basically like people use a guitar. Yeah. Right. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, people always say, oh, can you play some bluegrass stuff? No, that stuff's really technically advanced, you know, right. you gotta, you gotta actually gotta practice if you want to <laughs> do good with that. And then, you know, people, can you do some old timey stuff? Yeah, I can do some old timey stuff, but. I'm not. I'm not. You know, particularly 
good at it because I don't put in the practice that I should. Yeah. So. Well, it's good for everyone to know that uh, that uh, these serious uh, scholars and, 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 and professors of philosophy have wide and varied interests. <laughs> yeah, and, and um, you know, I, I, I tried to get my kids into it. They, they didn't get into it, but my daughter did pick up my bass for a while. Okay. And so we would sometimes play together. Like at our family reunion, we have skit night. You know, Uh-oh. we have this this family reunion that goes on for about three days <laughs> nice. once a year. And so we did a couple songs. We did uh, TNT by ACDC. <laughs> uh, I think we did a Kiss song at one time. Um, and it was, it was great. My son sang. My daughter played the bass and sang backup. And then I, I did the guitar part on the banjo. And... Uh, it's fun to do that that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. It, bring, it can bring people together like nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was going to ask you, uh, since you mentioned you, uh, like Cicero, have an eclectic mm. uh, philosophy. Um, so many of us, like me included, um, find a lot of benefit from what I know about Stoicism and I'm trying to learn more and, and also trying to read around Stoicism to some of the other philosophies as well. Okay. What would you recommend for those of us who, who uh, are trying to build a robust life philosophy but don't want to be uh, chained just to Stoicism? We're willing to look at other ideas. Where would be some good places to start? Oh, okay. So... Um, in, in like the ancient world, you know, the Stoics' big rivals were um, the Epicureans, mm-hmm. and we don't actually have that much of them, but but we do have some stuff from this Philodemus guy, um, and we're getting more of it as it gets translated. He was an he was an Epicurean um, much later than Epicurus himself, and you know they have some cool techniques for taking care of anger. Um, in his Philodemus' treatise. Um, there's a whole, you know, long Aristotelian tradition that Cicero is partly taking up. Um, Cicero is very influenced by Aristotle. And, you know, we've got Aristotle's texts themselves, which lend themselves to, like the Nicomachean Ethics, you can take a lot of that and turn it into, you know, practices for developing... Um, uh, virtues and understanding, you know, what, 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 actually Aristotle is one of the first people to use that, you know, what's in our control, what's not in our control. He just doesn't use it the way Epictetus does, but it's the same uh, terminology, you know, okay. the, the Ephemon and Uc Ephemon. And it shows up again in Aristotelians who are responding to the Stoics, like Alexander of Aphrodisias, who I'm a big fan of as well. Hmm. Um, he's got a cool book called On Fate. Um, where he's he's presenting a, an Aristotelian position, and he's also um, you know sort of engaging with the Stoics and the Epicureans. There's also you know a lot of people know from like taking a maybe a, a intro to philosophy class. You know, there's Plato, sure. um, but there's a whole Platonic tradition um, that Plutarch is is a major member of that we call Middle Platonism, and then okay. there's Neoplatonism later on, right. which which is a bit more. I mean, even Middle Platonism is kind of eclectic. Cicero, or Plutarch will pick up stuff from uh, the Stoics if he likes it, or he'll pick up a lot of stuff from Aristotle and usually attribute it to Socrates, like, you know, the Doctrine of the Mean. He says Socrates came up with that, which clearly uh-huh. is not, not, not true. But, right. um, but there, there's sort of there's this long tradition of, like, rethinking out the, the major commitments and tools of these philosophical positions originating in people like Plato and Aristotle, but, but dealing with new life problems in, uh, you know, a, a new context several centuries later, and then going into way more detail about like, well, how would you apply this stuff? So Plutarch's works are, are really cool. There's lots and lots of interesting stuff there. Um, and most people know him from the biographies, but he, he wrote just about as much that was straight out philosophy as hmm. well. Okay. Um, and then, you know, there's this guy, he's a commentator. He's not actually a Stoic. He's a, a Neoplatonist. Uh, Simplicius has this nice commentary in Epictetus' Enchiridion. He brings a lot of these, these things in together. So, you know, for people who want to, 
you could say go beyond the the big three, right? Plus mm-hmm. Cicero. Um, you can find a lot of interesting, ver- broadly virtue ethics, practically oriented perspectives in these these other ancient authors. And I would also say early Christian works too, some of them, where they're not just being kind of like stick your head in the sand and d- deny that, you know, Greek and Roman culture <laughs> had anything good to it, um, like Tertullian. Um, but there's there's like a, all these, these early Christian thinkers who are taking up um, – Stoic or Aristotelian ideas and running with them. So the early monastic writers like Evagrius Ponticus and uh, John Cassian, there's a lot of Stoic stuff in there. Okay. Um, and uh, a lot of Platonist stuff too as well. Um, or, you know, Justin Martyr or Lactantius. These are really interesting interlocutors. Um, and it's, it's good to know too that like the, 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 Later Christian authors, particularly the monastic authors, they they kept Seneca's letters, hmm. and they like you know they'd copy him out, and and he he and Cicero played a really significant role. Also, Epictetus in a sort of Christianized version of the Enchiridion, where they like uh, change the philosopher into uh, the monk and things like that, right? <laughs> and he had a, had a few spurious lines in there, right, uh, as well. But um, they, they, they thought that um, there was something really good there in, in this uh, non-Christian earlier literature that they could, they could mm-hmm. use. And um, you can, you know, when you look at some of these authors, you can see the influence of Stoic thinkers and, and sometimes, you know, Aristotelian and, and definitely Platonist thinkers on them. The one group they didn't like was the Epicureans. Right. You know, pretty right. much everybody dislikes them. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, the kind of detach from uh, from society a little bit, and uh, I guess they often are accused of being more sex, drug, and rock and roll than they really were, though, as my my understanding. Uh, yeah, it, it 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 appears that that was the case from what we have of their texts. Um, but one thing that that I think kind of made it tough for them was. It starts already with Epicurus. He's he's unlike the other um, school founders. He's not in the Socratic tradition. Um, you know, if you think about it, you got the Platonist Academy, Aristotle's Lyceum, the Stoa, uh, all these minor Socratic schools like the Cynics and, um, you know, the uh, uh, Megarians uh, who flow into the Stoics. They're all, they, and even the skeptics, they can all say that they're, they're Socratic in origin. Mm-hmm. And they all have a certain kind of basic respect for that tradition. Epicurus prided himself on being self-taught. Hmm. And they also, I mean, they were, they were kind of cultish too. Um, they, they, uh, they did withdraw from society, but they didn't withdraw like each to their own house. They withdrew to this garden. And it was kind of like a commune. Um, they, you know... They attributed uh, ideas that they came up with to the founder, Epicurus, um, or to Metrodorus, his, his buddy. Okay. And so, you know, it, it's um, – actually, Seneca talks about this early on in uh, – I think it's letter 33 when he's talking to um, Lucilius. He says, um, we Stoics, we don't have a monarch, whereas the Epicureans do. Ah, uh, Yes. You know. They would celebrate his birthday and all kinds of things, wouldn't they? The, the, and the, 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 the modern day Epicureans still do. Do they? On the twentieth, oh. yeah. They're, and and they're they're sort of like I'd say when it comes to philosophies of life, the Stoics are, are by far, unless unless we you know if we take like religious groups out of it, the Stoics are by far the biggest worldwide. But the Epicureans are the second largest. Hmm. Um, and they're out there. I, I've, I've never actually gone to any of their, their stuff. I, I reached out to a group once, tried to get a guest on the podcast to talk about it, but... Uh, didn't work? It didn't work out. I got passed from one to another, and then it faded away. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's an interesting strategy, isn't it? Maybe, maybe if, we, if we, like, make him jump through enough hoops, he'll just leave us alone. That's right. That, that's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know it's it's fascinating. This is so I'll I'll float an idea here 
that I've been kicking around for a while. And it's something having to do with the, the, both philosophy as a way of life and um, the history of ideas. Okay. And in a nutshell, it's this. Um, when people know about Hellenistic philosophy and, and later like Roman era philosophy, they, they often dismiss it and they say, oh, it's not as good as Plato and Aristotle. Um, Plato and Aristotle were, you know, really the, the, the founders of, of, you know, what we call the Western tradition and all this other stuff is just kind of eclectic mishmash or, or commentaries. No, nobody's really doing anything original. Well, maybe the Stoics and the Epicureans and the skeptics were, but, you know, then they quickly kind of succumb to this as well. And so everything is, is just kind of a, a mess and you can't tell who belongs to what school and, you know. And that's one way to look at it. That's if you place the emphasis on, on like originality and purity of tradition. Okay. The other way to look at it is that in this literature, um, so I'll put it in a really controversial way. <laughs> I think that as somebody who's, who's spent now about 20 years with Aristotle and who's been spending some time recently with Alexander of Aphrodisias, I think Alexander of Aphrodisias is actually better in mm. some respects because he's, um, he's, he's writing later on, so he's had the opportunity to write as an Aristotelian who is being faithful to a particular tradition um, and knows Aristotle's works very well and has a, has a chance to talk with other Aristotelians, but is also in conversation with Stoics, Epicureans, skeptics, um, the other movements that are out there. And provides a lot more interesting, concrete examples and, and, and discussions of things. I see. Um, and, and I think you can say the same thing with, like, say, Plutarch and Plato, or some of the later uh, uh, Neoplatonists and Plato. Um, I think that, you know, you can say that about eclectic authors like Galen, who most people think of as just a, you know, a medical tradition right. author, but Galen actually tells us a lot about the emotions. What we know of what Chrysippus has to say about the emotions is because Galen quoted him. Hmm. Uh, and so Galen was doing this interesting thing where he's engaging the Stoics and he's he's not he's not a Platonist. He says that that you know he's not like the Platonists of the time, but he also sort of thinks he can do Platonism better than them. Um, so I, you know what I'm finding in all this this uh, stuff is there's there's in some respect much more interesting. And not to say that Plato and Aristotle aren't interesting; they're super interesting. But this this purest vision is actually like bad history of of ideas. And the really cool stuff is there in these authors that we often don't get to when we're teaching intro to philosophy. Right. And sometimes don't even get taught in ancient philosophy classes because we run out of time. But are the people that we, we, we should really be looking at. And if we do that, I think the Stoics on the whole assume a greater importance. Um, you, can, you can also look at you know Seneca and, and Marcus Aurelius as being in some respect – less concerned with like pure stoic orthodoxy and more with like well how do we make stoicism work well and also use stuff from the aristotelians and you know in seneca's case even epicureans right um yeah he quotes epicurus quite a bit at least early on in the letters doesn't he <laughs> I, yeah and i think i think that's largely because he's writing to a guy who is either an epicurean or is is quite attracted to lucilius was yeah, yeah. into that um, and, he, and he actually, you know, he doesn't just bring up Epic, Epicurus and Metrodorus. He, in, in one of the letters, he mentions uh, Lucretius's um, work. Okay. Who would have been a much closer, uh, and, and a Roman author, you know. Um, so, yeah. I mean, and, and the idea is, um, it's, a, it's a good idea. If somebody's got something valuable... You try to appropriate it and make it your own. Sure. Rather than saying, oh, it comes from them, so it's no good. You know? <laughs> right, right. I just did a reading uh, last week on the podcast where Seneca talks about uh, being like a bee gathering nectar to make oh, honey. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and you, you get it wherever you find it and then make it your own. And you do that, according to him, by reading and writing. Uh, hand, you know, read, then do some writing and synthesize it into your own 
uh, your own uh, uh, way of thinking and, and internalize it as well as you can. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a really heavy, I mean, Epictetus, there's also a heavy emphasis on that. If you can't, it's great to like be able to read Chrysippus, but if you can't apply it, then you're just you're, you're just sort of uh, puttering around with uh, interpretation rather than right. And yeah. I guess we we could jump from there. The same idea that there's a lot to philosophy, like like you just said. What's the point of reading it if you can't apply it? Uh, we mentioned uh, you mentioned I think it's letter one thirteen, which is kind of interesting, yeah. where Seneca is talking about virtue and some of the stoic thoughts on what uh, what the good is or what goods are or virtues are and the fact that they they might be living things which i thought was a very strange idea <laughs> yeah and and it and it is a strange idea it's almost you know cicero has this work stoic paradoxes um and he only treats six paradoxes in that it's a very short work it's a good, good introduction too to stoicism i think um well, this is a Stoic paradox, uh, you know, an idea that goes against our normal way of thinking about things. Right. And Seneca and Seneca rejects it too. Yeah, he does. So he, he's saying, uh, yeah, you know, these other Stoics, they buy into that. Here's here's like you know, fifteen arguments why it's a bad <laughs> bad position to take. But you know, I, I was I was digging around as I was getting ready for this. <clears throat> Arius Didymus who is not a Stoic himself, but he, he wrote these epitomes um, for, for his son for teaching uh, about it. He wrote an epitome of Stoic ethics, and he actually, you know, he, he's trying to be totally unoriginal. Just, just what is it the Stoics say? He references this idea. He says um, that the, uh, the virtues... He says here, they, he says they, they want the soul in us to be a living creature since it lives and has awareness. This is particularly true of the controlling part of it, which is called mind. So, so far, so good. Then he says, hence, every virtue is a living creature since it is the same as mind in essence. In accordance with this, they say that intelligence is intelligent for it's consistent with these things to speak in this way. And then he doesn't, he doesn't go any further with that. But... That, that reference shows us that they were, at least some of the Stoics were saying, that the virtues within us, within our minds, which, which are living creatures, animalia in, in uh, um, Seneca's term, um, meaning animate things, the virtues themselves are in some way animate. And, and I think that there's... There's ways of thinking about this that are probably attractive to some people when we think about, you know, when Epictetus says, you run into a problem, consider what resources you have to deal with it. You see a, a good-looking boy or girl, um, you know, uh, you've got temperance to deal with that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so the idea is like the virtues are within us as these kind of reservoirs that we can draw upon. But how do we draw upon them? We, we let the virtues do their job. And Seneca wants to say that's, that's problematic for a number of different reasons. I mean, some of them are kind of interesting metaphysically. He says, you know, there's, there, there's this notion of, um, he doesn't use the term here, but when people are talking in philosophy of mind, um, and about parts of the mind, we don't want them to turn into homunculi, little tiny men inside of us that have like their own agency and all that, right? So <laughs> if, if we have virtues and they, they are living things that seem to be like they're doing their own thing when we're not, we're not focusing on them, then we open the door to all sorts of problems because then every one of our thoughts, he says, and all of our emotions are similarly like that. And then, then we don't really have the unity of, of a single person. We're kind of like a hodgepodge of all these different, I don't know, whatever they are, dynamics or, you know, parts of us. And then it actually sounds more like Nietzsche than like stoicism, you know, and all these, these little wills tied together. Um, so there's, there's arguments like that, but, you know, for a lot of Seneca's worries about it, it's more like, listen, our mind is what's animate, 
And insofar as virtue has any sort of agency, it does so by being part of us or being in, in the mind or being a, <clears throat> a mode of the mind, a way in which the mind is disposed. So you could say, he doesn't use this term, but you could say that virtue is almost parasitical upon um, the mind in which it resides, or if you like, the, you know, the personality or however you want to put right. it. Um, so the virtue, the virtue, I mean, the, the mind is the substance, and the, and the virtue is essentially a mode of that, that substance, a way for that substance to be. Um, and he, you know, he points out, he says, virtues themselves don't assent to things. Um, it's the mind that assents. Um, so the, you know, he, he wants to, he wants to see us as having, uh, you know, substantive self that can either have virtues or have vices. And, um, he's got a kind of some silly arguments in there as well. Like, well, animate things can get hungry or cold or, you know, uh, uh, tired, so you're going to say justice gets hungry, yeah, or does, does justice go for a walk, or <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think he's right uh, about that. I, his his version of it makes sense to me. Um, and I think actually, you know, like I mentioned, the the medieval monks they copied out Seneca's letter collection and they read it as part of um, you know part of what you would do in the Benedictine tradition is you would have a book that you would get to like focus on for a while. Mm -hmm. And it could be, you know, Christian literature or it could be, could be pagan literature. And a lot of times, you know, the pagan literature is quite popular, especially Seneca because he's such a great writer. Right. I, I think that this, this argument um, may have, and this is total speculation on my part, but may have influenced some discussions about um, the substance of the human person in, in some of the monastic authors in, you know, like, say, the 11th century. Wow. Um, just because I see parallels there. I don't, okay. I don't see anyone saying, well, Seneca said sure. X, Y, Z. Um, but, you know, it, it's a very interesting kind of account. And, and it's, it's good that he, I mean, he complains. He says, you know, you're asking me about this, this crazy question. Uh, this is kind of a waste of time. But, it, but it's not really a waste of time. It's, it's, it's good to clarify these things. Um, sometimes Seneca can be a little bit too practically oriented. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know he says, indeed, I shall never cease to tickle my mind and to make sport for myself by means of this nice nonsense. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but he, yeah. does, he does go straight to practicality then. Teach me not whether bravery be a living thing, but prove that no living thing is happy without bravery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, he he does kind of bash it. He's like, and he even says, he, he you know, you don't. All, the Stoics have not always agreed with each other. Like Chrysippus and Cleanthes didn't agree on everything. Uh, yeah, and he doesn't agree in this sense that virtue is a living being in the same sense that <laughs> that other Stoics did. It's just an odd, like you said, an odd way of looking at it, but. I wish we knew more about, about it. And there, there may be some interesting discussions of this. And some of the authors that I've mentioned that I either haven't, haven't read the entire corpus of, like, um, I mean, this might be discussed. I should check in. Plutarch has, has a, a piece where he's opposing the Stoics called On Stoic Self-Contradictions. And um, if Plutarch is indeed being fair to them, then, um, you know, Presumably, the stuff that's in there is stuff that Stoics actually said. Right. At least some of the Stoics actually said. So I should probably check in there to see whether there's a reference to this this odd doctrine. <laughs> another another line I enjoyed though, just the idea of from Seneca's view that some things were not worth arguing about. He says we dull our fine edge by such um, such pursuits. These things make men clever, but not good. Yeah. So, so worrying about arguing for argument's sake rather than improving character i guess <laughs> yeah yeah without thinking of the what the upshot of it is you could say um i mean i encounter and and you know as you you get more and more people like listening to your podcast and your twitter thing grows you're gonna get more and more of this too i encounter a lot of interlocutors who basically just want to argue <laughs> and i i you know nowadays i actually block and ban people quite quite frequently on on youtube twitter um, 
face, my Facebook page and even LinkedIn um, if somebody's wow. being kind of a pain. And and at first I, I didn't do that. I'd like sort of suffer with them and try to like you know say, well, you should look at things this way. And then and then they just they just be tendentious about it. <laughs> and as I've gotten more and more busy and, and I'm more and more conscious of like, well, who knows how many more years I get. I, I, I look at it as they don't, I don't know them anything. I just be, by being out there in the marketplace of ideas, I don't have to engage with them. Sure. Um, I don't even have to like, let them be on my page if they want to be jerks. And this is something actually that, that, that Massimo and I, um, had a Twitter exchange about a while back. And he's got kind of a similar, he's, he's done some writing about it. I've done some writing about it. I want to eventually get us to, to have a talk about this. Um, cause he's got, he's got it. Like if I've got it, you know, a little bit, he's got it even more cause he's got a much bigger presence. <laughs> and, and, and the idea is we, we, there's nothing sort of inherently non-stoic about saying, I don't have to give time to people who just want to fritter my, my time away. Sure. You know, um, Seneca and, warns us about sh- giving a little bit of us there, giving a little over here. Yeah, and the next exactly. thing you know, it's all gone, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and Epictetus tells us too. You got to watch out who you're company with, mm-hmm. um, and and if if they're mostly interested in like trying to score points and win arguments, probably sooner or later you're going to want to do that too, even if you start out not not doing that sort of thing, <laughs> um, because they you know our companions. He's got that passage about you know if you. You hang around with people who are like you know in the mud. You're gonna get you're gonna mud on you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so yeah, yeah. It is. You see someone that tries to get you or whatever, and then it's like, do I respond? I really want to respond, but what's in it for me other than hours more of my time arguing? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and, and a, there's a temptation when you're when you've become a public figure to say, well, you know, it would be. I should respond to this because then other people can see like, you know, how one could handle this sort of thing. Or um, I don't want to leave their point unanswered because then people will think that, you know, their their position is, you know, particularly strong or good and it just can't be answered. And, and I, you know, I, at a point I was like, well, it's not my job to actually uh, do all that work, you know. <laughs> right. Um it's not like you're and in the classroom uh, where a student yeah. raises their hand and you. <laughs> yeah, it was very liberating to, to realize that. You know? <laughs> so now I now I block and ban and with you know relative impunity. Um, <laughs> I look forward. I wish I could go two thousand years in the future to uh, when they're when they're reading your writings and they're like, ah, oh, block and ban with impunity. <laughs> you know the. The writings of uh, <laughs> well, I don't know if anything of mine is going to be around. You know, <laughs> well, Marcus didn't. Th- Marcus didn't think his would be around either. So you know, true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, wouldn't wouldn't he be surprised if he saw all these people who seem to think that Marcus is writing to them, you know, <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> not realizing that it's that it's you know his his own little jotting things down book. Right. Yeah. His 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 notes to self are now in everyone's hands. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, is there anything else you'd like to discuss before we bring our conclusion to it? Well, you know, it's, it's kind of a cool time of the year, right? For Stoics. So I I suppose we should probably put in a plug. Yeah. Um, as everybody knows, Stoic week is coming up in early October and, um, I, I, you know, I've just taken a look because we're proofreading it at the, uh, the materials for Stoic Week, and they look great as as they do every year. They always add a little bit and take a little bit out, you know, tweak it a bit. Um, and there's going to be some, you know, some cool events coming up. Um, not just Stoicon X events, but also people are celebrating Stoic Week by having smaller, you know, talks or get-togethers. Um, and uh, we, you know we'll post all of that on the Modern Stoicism site and the, the uh, Stoicism Today blog. Um, and we're having a Stoicon X here in Milwaukee too. Wow, great! So for for people who are local, you know, like the Milwaukee area, the Fox Cities, the Chicagoland area, or if people want to drive in for it, it's actually free. And we uh, think thanks to the generosity of a, a sponsor who wants to remain anonymous, we're able to offer uh, a catered lunch and oh. coffee and um, 
Yeah, it's going to be a really great event. We got three three speakers lined up, um, t- two of whom are, are local right here to Milwaukee. Okay. Um, one one of whom's driving in, Kevin Vost, the author of the Porch and the Cross. Oh yeah. He's driving in from Illinois, and then we've got um, Dan Hayes, who is is one of the people who's heavily involved in the um, Milwaukee Stoic Fellowship. He actually leads these really cool walk and talks weekly where they read like a little passage of Marcus Aurelius and walk around the park and discuss it. Hmm. And then Daniel Collette, who's a visiting assistant professor at Marquette University. And then we're going to do these lightning round talks where, you know, short three to five minute talks that anybody who wants to in the audience can give. And then my wife and I, um, Andy Shaka, um, she and I are going to give the um, a version of the workshop on Stoicism and relationships that I ended up giving at, at Stoicon 2018. We were supposed to give it together, but unfortunately she wasn't cleared oh. to travel at the time. So that will be, um, hopefully, uh, you know, a treat for some of the, the people um, yeah. attending. So it's, a, it's a, you know, we, it's kind of cool. Like you look at the map, we got, you know, Stoicon X happening in London and Toronto and New York and San Francisco and Moscow and one in New England. And then Milwaukee. <laughs> and Milwaukee. I, 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 I'm afraid I haven't organized one in Conway, Arkansas yet, but... Uh... Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's nice when you can make your home city, you know, you put your home city in a list with... with yeah, really Moscow, my hometown, and... <laughs> yeah, exactly. So That's pretty cool. Yeah, um, so we're, re- we're really looking forward to that. That's that's coming up on... It's during Stoic Week on, on the, the Saturday, the, the 12th. Okay. Um, so if any of your listeners are interested, I can give you the link to that. Yeah, um, great. I'll put it in thing. the show description. Okay. And yeah. uh, where can they go to find out more from you? Probably, I mean, just type in Gregory B. Sadler and all sorts of stuff will come up in Google, um, including my, my, my YouTube channel. Um, that's probably the easiest way to do okay. it. They can go to Reason.io if they want to. That's my, my business site. Um, but I'm, I'm actually so busy right now that I'm not taking on too many new clients. So. <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dr. Sadler, thank you for joining the podcast this week. And well, th- uh, Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'd love to chat with you again sometime. Sounds good. Thank you for listening to The Sunday Stoic. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review The Sunday Stoic on iTunes. Become a member of The Sunday Stoic team, earn rewards, and be an integral part of the show by becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash sundaystoic. Contact the show by emailing sundaystoic at gmail.com or by leaving a voicemail at 501-503-3132. To find out more, visit www.sundaystoicpodcast.com. And as Steve always says, carpe diem. (laughs) 